Welcome, everybody. This is the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. Every week we are looking to bring you stories of people who make a difference in the lives of others locally, globally, and digitally. And our goal as, as Rotarians, members of Rotary International, 1.2 million members in 36,000 clubs around the world, is to share stories of, of interesting ways that people find to make their communities better. Now that often means like looking for perspectives that, that maybe we don't normally get to hear. And I am so excited today to bring to our club, Troy Williams. You'll have read his bio coming in. Troy has, has a fascinating history. He is a journalist. He is a, a man who works to bring good to the lives of others. And I am excited to have you hear his story as well. Troy, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the Rotary e Club of Silicon Valley. Uh, yeah, thank you for um, having me. Um, thank you for this uh, opportunity to share the work that we do. Uh, it's really appreciated, and, and uh, I'm I'm happy. Excellent. Start off by telling us a little bit about um, about your background, and then about legal services for prisoners with children. So my my background is that you know I grew up in Los Angeles. Um, I grew up at a time when. Um, this thing called Crip was flowing through Los Angeles like a wildfire. And I got sucked up into that, into that world, not wanting to be a part of it, but feeling as though I had no alternative. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up at a time where um, we could not actually, in our communities, depend on the police to protect us. And so we try in our ways to protect ourselves and protect our loved ones ourselves. Um, ultimately, um, that led me into some behaviors that led me to prison. Uh, and I spent uh, 25 years of my life incarcerated. And while incarcerated, I was able to really do some, I guess, for lack of a better word, some really remarkable things inside. Um, at least a lot of people tell me they, they're remarkable. Excellent, excellent, excellent. <laughs> and, um, but I was able to like turn my life around in a way that allows me to utilize the experiences that I've been through um, to help my community, um, to give young people who are in the situation that I was in, um, some of the experience that I have that allows them to see their situation a little bit differently. You know, I saw mine as not having a choice. And when in uh, looking back, you know, hindsight is always 2020. Um, there were other alternatives and other means that I could have used that I did not use. But also, I think even as importantly, as important is the fact that uh, I became very aware of all this, the systemic um, things that are in place that contributed to some of the decision-making that I made as a young person, right? Um, environment is a very, uh, has a, plays a, a major role in, in how you see yourself being able to move and maneuver. Um, and if your environment is very restrictive, then hence more than likely your perception of how you can move through it, it's gonna be very restricted. Uh, and so um, after spending a lot of time in prison, um, you know, I was able to create some media programs while incarcerated. I was able to, uh, I started participating in self-help groups. I started facilitating self-help groups. And then um, I started creating self-help groups. Uh, I came home actually a little bit over seven years ago now. And last year I was approached by Dorsey Nunn, the executive director of legal services for prisoners with children who hired me as communications manager for the organization. And my role here is to ensure that, um, that as an organization, as formerly incarcerated people that we are being recognized for the leadership uh, in the work that we do and for the experience 
and uh, insight that we bring to the table, which will ultimately contribute to transforming our communities into something where we all feel safe within them. We all feel like we have an opportunity to thrive um, within our communities. And, you know, and when I, when I, when I talk about safety, um, I'm talking about safety from institutions that are um, dominantly, um, predominantly considered oppressive in black and brown communities. Mm -hmm. um, that is the type of safety that I'm referring to. Yes. All right. Well, you use the word transforming, right? And, and so, so much about, about what you describe in your life represents a transformation. You know, you, you, were, you were in a certain set of circumstances, you ended up in prison, you had opportunities that you took, you, that you took while you were there. Uh, that led you to a certain amount of legal education. It led you to become a journalist. And I'd like you to take a minute and talk a little bit about that as well. Yes. I, um, well, I was forced into trying to understand the law. <laughs> um, <laughs> my goal was freedom. So when I, you know, I participated in a takeover robbery of a computer parts company. And that actually, uh, you know, it's, it's a much longer story, but um, my participating in that led me to receiving uh, a, a life sentence, life with the possibility of parole. Mm -hmm. So one of the first things that I wanted to do was to understand the law. I, I could not understand how I was being convicted based on what was alleged what my co-defendant was said to have done. However, he was found not guilty. And I was found guilty based on what they said he did and sentenced to life with the possibility of parole, even though he was found not guilty of the same act. And everyone even knew that I was never even at the scene where the kidnapping during the commission of robbery like occurred. So when I went to prison, I walked into the law library and one of the first things that one of the guys asked me was, uh, well, one of the first things that, you know, I asked inside the law library, I was like, you know, I, I need to learn the law. I need to understand like what happened in my case. I, I, I don't understand how, you know, I could be convicted based on what they said he did, you know, and he's not, he got found not guilty. Like how, did, how does that happen in American, you know, in the, the American judicial system, right? Um, and one of the first things the guy said to me was, welcome to the new slave ship. Mm -hmm. And he handed me a copy of the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution. Um, and I was told to read that. And that was the beginnings of my introduction into law. You know, I later um, became a certified paralegal and I had to study the, you know, theories of conspiracy and substantial distance and the law as it pertains to, you know, um, the elements of kidnapping during the commission of a crime, how to write a writ of habeas corpus, how to file um, appeals and try to challenge the system um, through and through, um, learning about actual innocence claims and the rest of it that goes with, you know, legal matters. Um, so that was my my introduction, like to the law, and me trying to uh, overturn what I saw as an injustice, while at the same time realizing that, um, and I really want the audience, you know, to understand that I in no way minimize my own participation, you know, in in the crime itself. Um, so when I speak of when I speak of transformation, I speak of my ability to have the insight and the wherewithal to own my participation, to own what it was that I did, to understand what were the causes the factors that led me down that path uh, in the first place. And some of them come from um, personal choices. Some of them come from um, trying to overcome things that were going on in my environment. And some of them come from, you know, some systemic issues that have existed you know, for people like me in this country since we were brought to these shores. Hmm. So, so how did that, how did that experience 
open up a an opportunity for you to become a journalist? Well, um, because we, by the way, I, I should say for, for anybody who didn't kind of read fully the the bio coming in, you you have you have received awards for your journalism, right? I mean, you have done a lot of really strong work as a journalist, yeah. and, and I think you know, I mean, I can hear you talking about complexities within a story in order for people to understand and, 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 and assume that like, that's also a part of your thinking as a journalist, but, but what got you to that point? So, I, I mean, I've always, you know, fancied myself a poet. Um, All right. And, you know, back in the day, I, you know, tried my hands very slightly, very minimally, <laughs> if that's, a, if I can say it like that in, um, you know, hip hop. Right. Um, but, when I when I'm in prison and I'm trying to study the law, what I had to realize was that I have to be able to tell the story to the audience that needs to hear it in a way that they receive information. And so I also wanted to tell my story to the world. Like I really wanted to tell like a story of transformation uh, to the world in a way that young people who might be situated um, in what, you know, I was going through and with all the reasons of why and how and all of that, I wanted to be able to reach them. And I wanted to be able to figure out a way to, to, to tell these stories in a way that people could receive them to actually get resources directed in a way that, that, that we need them. Um, and so, I started writing actually some creative stories. Um, I joined the creative writing class when I was inside, so that helped um, you know focus my skill set in writing. And then the newspaper came back into effect uh, in San Quentin, and I started originally writing for the newspaper, and then I broke away and created um, a, a show. Um, a radio and video production show inside of the prison that was called the San Quentin Prison Report. Uh, and my goal was, I got tired of being demonized by the world who did not understand my story. Every time I sat inside and a reporter would come inside, they would present themselves to us as though they were going to speak the truth of our story and they were going to, you know, help get the word out about who we were and our transformation. And ultimately, all I saw originally was these fear mongering stories. Right. Um, and I'm like, it's just like the movies, right? Like, mm -hmm. like my original, um, one of the original things that, well, let me, let me back up a second. All right. I, I studied five things when I was in prison. I studied the law, I studied history, I studied religion, I studied media production, all aspects, video, radio, and, and writing. Um, and I studied myself. Um, from watching movies, watching the news, like I said, there are there's always these fear-mongering tactics. There's always these tactics that that either if you're black, you're the buffoon, or you're you know the menace in the movie. You know things are changing now, of course, um, but this is what the the journey that I started on is that I wanted to tell us to tell our own stories and not allow other people to come in who may not have been um, as empathetic or even sympathetic to our stories um, to step out the way and. Let us tell our own stories in a way that we need the world to see and we need the world to hear. So that, that's what got me started, like writing, is really this drive to, to speak my own truth. Mm. Um, and when I started writing, my writings were pretty well received, and that encouraged me to write even more. Uh, so so when, when you talk about the need to tell the story, right? You're essentially addressing the the misconception that that any given group, any given population, is simpler than they are. 
And so if we look at something like being a prisoner, you know, there, 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 there will be those for whom the idea of being a prisoner is, is, is like you said, this menacing person. But there, there are people in prison who, who their, their parents, their, their fathers, their, their mothers, there their, are any number of reasons they, they may have gotten there, but they have children, right? And, and so, so at some point along the way, your ability to tell the story catches the eye of, of, the, of the folks at, at prisoners with children, and they bring you in. Tell me a little bit about that role that you're in now with LSPC. So the, the role that I'm in now is really both in, internal and externally. Internally, um, we are aligning the vision of the leadership there. Um, and when I say the vision of the leadership, you know, we have our executive director, Dorsey Nunn. We have our um, administrative director, uh, Hamdia. Um, and they, you know, like they're like, you know, for lack of a better term, they're like the parents of the organization, right? Like they're, they've been around, they've been doing this, they're both formerly incarcerated um, and they're like, they know they stuff. They, they know they've been doing this for a very long time and they have a lot of insight and they're, they're transferring that insight into um, the rest of us who come to the table with our own insights. Right, we come to our table with our own abilities. So my goal is to is one on one level to take that, shape that, so that we're speaking out to the world with a unified voice. Voice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, externally, this is where the external channels come in. At is that aligning our our media, aligning our um, our the, the documentaries, the the podcast, the the our newspaper. Um, aligning um, the voice of those of us who are formerly incarcerated and those of us who are uh, currently incarcerated, aligning the voice of who we are today so that the outside world can actually get a glimpse that, you know what, if we actually really want change and transformation within our society, within our community, we have to actually bring the people who have the knowledge base to come in and do it, right? So, and I say this on this level that people go to school and they learn theoretical applications of the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. They learn theoretical applications of transformation. Um, and there's a place for theory, right? But there's also a place for practical lived experience, mm -hmm. right? And what we say is that you cannot um, um, speak for us without us, right? So many times that I've been in areas and people will be saying, well, this is what we need. This is what formerly incarcerated people need. I've interviewed several people and this is what they're saying that they need, right? But there's a lot, there's a lot more nuance to just interviewing somebody, right? I can interview somebody all I want to on how an apple tastes, but I don't know it until I taste the apple, mm -hmm. right? And so if you haven't had that lived experience and you're speaking for us and one of us is not at that table, then you're actually doing a, 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 a disservice to us, right? Because you're saying that we're not actually good enough to be at the table of transformation. So, so in, in thinking about how you describe that, there are there are these experiences within the rotary world that 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 are not dissimilar you know the the speaking for those that that rotary clubs seek to help with their projects without properly getting enough info from them to know how to do it well and and, and to create more sustainable programs over time uh, a lot of people in rotary have learned to to better listen to the people that they connect with you know where where, where if someone is saying we need some help with this. They learn to listen. Tell me more. How does that work? Could something like this make a difference? Oh, why not? Oh, okay, good. So how can, can we address this this way? And, and so it, it seems like there are opportunities in our society to tap the talents of people who have been within the prison system 
to, to be able to give perspectives on helping our communities in new ways. Would, would you agree with that? I, I agree with that. And I, I want to say that traditionally, right, like it's not just about listening, right? It is listening. Mm -hmm. Listening is great. We have to actually listen so that we can hear. But we also like listen and follow the leadership. Like, cause sometimes people will listen and then they'll go out and they'll build something for them to do for our community because they've listened to us. What we're saying is no, actually listen to us and be willing to follow our leadership. Right. Like be willing to, because we, we have a set of experiences that, that has great value along this journey of transforming our society, right? Um, and we're not just talking about on the street level, but we're dealing with policies. Like right now, as an organization, um, we are um, fighting to have the involuntary servitude clause removed from California's constitution. Can you describe that, that clause for people who might be like, Need a little help on that front. So a lot of us were told in school, this is one of the nuances of the school thing I was saying. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of us were told in school that uh, slavery was abolished, right? However, we were not told about the exception to slavery, right? The, the Both the United States Constitution and California Constitution state, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, they state slavery shall be abolished except after having been duly convicted of a crime. And so now a criminal offense is a means of forcing somebody into labor, right? So I worked as a video technician pretty much the last eight years of my incarceration. I was paid 37 cents an hour to run our closed circuit system for the institution. Firefighters, we're all even more aware of what incarcerated firefighters go through, getting paid, I think something like a dollar a day to put their lives on the line to fight fires. And then when you're released, you're given $200 and you're told, good luck. Now, some people here might spend $200 on a meal. Imagine having $200 to your name to start your life over with and nowhere to sleep that night. But you got $200 in your pocket and that's all you got. And that's all you've been released with after being incarcerated for 20, 30, 40, and in some cases, 50 years. In the United States, have there been states that have, have repealed laws that, that allow prisoners to be paid, you know, just, just a pittance uh, that maybe that it becomes more in line with minimum wage or anything. Is, is there anything that, that, that's in process on that? There are, uh, there are some states, I believe, that have repealed. I, I couldn't name them offhand. There mm -hmm. are some states, but I don't know any state that actually pays minimum wage. Mm -hmm. I don't know any state that actually pays and somebody could find out different. I would love to see it. California needs to follow that example. But I don't personally know any um, state that actually pays incarcerated people a living wage that is comparable to what they would need to survive in society. Right. Um, and I said this in my TED talk. I said that over nine hundred thousand dollars was paid to keep me incarcerated for the time of doing the, the, uh, my incarceration, which was about, you know, I think nowadays it's probably about $75,000 a year to keep someone incarcerated. Mm -hmm. I've heard that number, yeah. Right, but I was given $200 to stay out, right? And, 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 and I don't wanna say like to stay out, like somebody's gonna pay you to stay out, but, but if the only resource that I have coming home is $200, right? And then we're not looking at how or why people find themselves um, back into criminal elements when you come home with $200 and you go to get a job and they say, well, check the box that says 
um, you've been incarcerated. And as soon as that box is checked, you know you're not getting employed. Um, you hungry, you, your baby's crying. Um, and, and the only thing that is available to you is, you know, the corner pharmacy, right? right. Um, what do we, I mean, what do we expect? So, so where, where does an organization like Legal Services for Prisoners with Children begin to move the needle in, in, in a different direction, where, where, where there's some hope for somebody coming out of prison that, that there, w- there will be some path? So first, there is an example after example of example of people who actually are employed by the organization living a, 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 a transformed life. Right. So I think that's first being able to identify with the examples that look like me, that come from where I come from, that has built, you know, a multi million dollar organization that employs 80 to 90 percent of the people. And and I think it's somewhere like 90 percent of the people employed by legal services for prisons with children are formerly incarcerated people. Right. So first you have that example. Then we're in the community. We're speaking with people. We're at the high schools. We're we're at the Lake Mary. We're having conversations. We're at First Friday. We're having conversations with people about what it takes to uh, we're inside the prison. Right. We're creating programs to go back inside the prison as well um, right now. So um, of what it takes to actually not only just transform your life personally, but we're also on a policy basis, we're also speaking to legislators and policymakers about um, policies, laws that are in in effect uh, enabling people's ability to live a productive life Mm -hmm. and enabling people's ability to actually be treated as human and civilly in a society that says that's what we're about, right? So we're challenging, um, you know, ban the box. I think um, the result of ban the box affected millions of people in California who no longer have to check that box um, that they've been incarcerated, Mm -hmm. right? That was one of the flagship, you know, bills that we fought for. We're, We're fighting right now to remove the this language of involuntary servitude so that the next step will be so that people can have an opportunity to 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 earn income while they're in there uh, and take care of their family like let's not just look at the sweatshops in China. let's look at the sweatshops like in the license plate makers and the, the 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 video technicians and the firefighters and the plumbers the electricians the cooks you know, all of these jobs, the maintenance crew, yard crew, all of these jobs that are ran by incarcerated people, like, let's just take a look at what the toll of that does for somebody to spend 18 years making 13 cents an hour. Um, and and I, I, you make 13 cents an hour and a soup costs 25 cents. So you, you got to make, you got to work two hours just to get a, a top ramen soup. Right. So we have to we're looking at into all of these different things. We, we actually have about eight different policies um, that we're like working on are going to be um, working on for um, the year of 2022. So we're our goal. We're removing these obstacles and we're calling out to community and we're saying we need you all on board because we realize that we can't do this in a vacuum no more than the person who has a theoretical degree can do it in a vacuum. So as a society, we have to come together. I need people to see my fight as their fight um, so that we can come together and build and build what we need to build out um, so that we can remove these obstacles for our young people. You know, the, the, our young people should not be faced with the things that they're faced with you know, in the society. And we're, our goal is to remove as many obstacles from that as we can. Um, and some of that takes place on a street community level. Some of that takes place on the educational level. And some of that takes place on a policy uh, legal level um, where we're fighting for change. Well, 
as we are running out of time, I want, what I want to do is, is actually end on the note of, of fighting for change, because I think that as, as anyone interested in service can attest, there are a lot of things that need improvement. And so finding that, that peace in your heart that says, this is the thing that I want to make a difference with becomes something very important. And we always ask our, our viewers after they have, have watched one of these recordings, to take a look at the, at the links that are just below. Learn a little bit more about Prisoners with Children as, as an organization. Uh, there's a couple of Facebook links there as well that you can follow to learn more as well. Feel, feel free to give that a look. We, we're going to hand it back to our speaker in just a moment uh, to give us a final word, but those of you who have joined us, please let us know you were here. If you are a visiting Rotarian and you're looking to make up a missed meeting, then by putting your email address in correctly, you'll get one that you can pass along to your club secretary. A little bit farther down the page, you'll see our Discuss, D-I-S-Q-U-S, our Discuss forum, where you can say a little bit about what you learned, what you, what you think about, how you react to the, the content that we share in these programs and anything else in the meeting as well. You can reply to others who have left messages as well. We hope that you will, you will find what we share with you to be thought provoking, to inspire you to see possibilities for improving your communities. And we are excited to be able to have that opportunity on a regular basis to share these stories with you. As we always like to do, we hand it back to our speaker, Troy. I'm gonna put the microphone back in your hands. How do we finish up today? Um, I just, I wanna say, um... You know, I'm sure you, you're going to put the link in and go to prisonerswithchildren.org and just go through our website and see um, what we're doing. Follow us on social media. Uh, you can follow us on as All of Us and None is our grassroots organizing chapter. So um, our, our headquarters is in Oakland. So you can look up uh, Oakland chapter of All of Us and None and friend us on Instagram, on Facebook and follow our policies. Um, follow what it is that we're doing, and we need your support. If anybody wants to reach out directly, you can reach me at Troy at prisonerswithchildren.org, um, and I would love to hear from you. And the last thing I'll say is that in March, well, we have two events coming up, or three events. Actually, we have an event on the 10th and 11th of next week, our community give back, where we're giving um, kids bikes, making sure that the kids have um, some, some, some gifts that are actually um, coming from their parents who are incarcerated. So we're making sure that they have bikes to ride um, this, this, um, this year. We're having um, a family uh, event um, where we're actually challenging the um, visitation law as it um, exists in California coming up in January. Uh, and we're also in March, we're having a big exhibit uh, in March and a discussion around issues of formerly incarcerated um, people and, and currently incarcerated issues that are happening um, throughout the country. So we're going to have about 200 people from all over the country um, coming in and we're going to take that boat ride over to Alcatraz um, and we're going to have a conversation at that um, signature place. Um, so that we can get the ball rolling for 2022 uh, let the world know what we're doing. And we want to hear from you. We want to work with you and we want you to work with us. Fantastic, Troy. Thank you for your presentation, everyone. Thank you for joining us and we will see you next week.